humble mug. If you spent any substantial amount of time during your childhood playing games, chances are there are a good handful of titles that for you harken back to a simpler time. Games that you know like the back of your hand, games you don't mind picking up every now and then to rip through some levels real quick for that sweet sweet dopamine and nostalgia hit. For those that have familiarized themselves with games from the 80s and onwards, that list of games likely includes classic titles like the original Super Mario Bros. on the NES. It's so easy to blast through the first few worlds when you've got the game so deeply ingrained into your muscle memory. Another one that never gets old for me is 1993's Doom. I could practically live inside of episode 1 of that game. Though there are many elements to both of these games that make them iconic, one key quality that both Super Mario Bros. and Doom share is that they are engaging and enjoyable to play, and that is actually in spite of how simple the gameplay is. In fact, the simplicity of both games' gameplay loops could be the very reason why they're so fun and appealing to play. Though not nearly as impactful to the gaming industry as those two games are, and let's be real here, what games can measure up to Super Mario Bros. or Doom when it comes to video game relevancy? Another game from my childhood that I really love to revisit is Gauntlet Dark Legacy. And like Mario or Doom, Dark Legacy is a game that can make the hours burn away like they're nothing. In this video, I want to give an in-depth look into Gauntlet Dark Legacy, starting with a little bit of background on the Gauntlet franchise as a whole, explaining why I think Dark Legacy has garnered a bit of a cult status, and how I think a modern remake of the game could do well in today's market. Gauntlet is a franchise that has actually been around since 1985, and its first entry was initially made by Atari. It is a game where you play as either a warrior, wizard, valkyrie, or elf, and you go through a series of maze-like dungeons fighting waves and waves of enemies that respawn constantly until you destroy their generators. It was extremely profitable upon release, and this eventually got the company Midway's attention, who ended up striking a deal with Atari to gain the rights to many of their franchises, including Gauntlet. Dark Legacy is actually the seventh entry in the series, hitting arcades first in 1999 and then seeing console sequels between 2001 and 2002 depending on the platform. And though technically considered a sequel, Dark Legacy is more or less just an expansion to the sixth title in the franchise, Gauntlet Legends. It's with Legends that I actually became familiar with the Gauntlet franchise as a whole. Legends, and by extension Dark Legacy, was Midway's first attempt in translating the Gauntlet series into 3D, and I think they did a great job. You have to keep in mind that this all took place from 1998 to 1999 initially, back when many franchises were trying to make that jump from 2D to 3D. Games like Castlevania 64 and Earthworm Jim 3D released the same year as the arcade release of Gauntlet Dark Legacy, and even the defenders of those titles will usually admit that those first 3D attempts in Castlevania and Earthworm Jim marked a noticeable dip in quality compared to their 2D predecessors. When it comes to games seen as perhaps more similar to Gauntlet in their gameplay and settings, such as the Golden Axe or Altered Beast franchise, Golden Axe Beast Rider for the Xbox 360 and PS3 and the Altered Beast reboot for the PlayStation 2 were both seen as spectacular failures whose dark and gritty takes on these otherwise colorful and fantastical franchises made fans feel like the developers sort of missed the point of what made the original so good. Not to mention that these games came out long after the initial boom of 2D to 3D gaming. So I wanted to make sure I give credit to Midway for getting it right the first time, during what was arguably the most challenging transitionary period for developers in video game history. Not only did Gauntlet Legends and Gauntlet Dark Legacy capture what made the original Gauntlet games so special, but I would argue these titles belong in that first class of video game franchises to make the jump to 3D successfully, just a few short years after Super Mario 64 seem to set the standard. Before I jump into the parts of the game that seem to make it so special for me, I want to first discuss possibly the game's weakest element so I can go ahead and get that out of the way. And unfortunately, that is the game's graphics. Although I still stand by my statement that the Gauntlet franchise made a successful transition to 3D, and in fact I personally think the 3D titles are better than their predecessors, this is perhaps the only example of a game I can think of where it simultaneously successfully and unsuccessfully translated to 3D because it admittedly looks pretty ugly, even compared to other games released around this time. But to cut the game some well-deserved slack for a second, especially when we are talking about the console release of Gauntlet Dark Legacy on the PlayStation 2, Xbox, and GameCube, I think it's a little unfair to compare this game graphically to somewhat similar titles released on those consoles. 
Games like the Lord of the Rings movie tie-in games or Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance were made for the GameCube, Xbox, and PlayStation 2. You have to remember that this game is just an expansion of Gauntlet Legends which originally ran on the PlayStation 1, Dreamcast, and Nintendo 64. Dark Legacy on the GameCube, for example, is more or less a straight port of the original arcade version released two years prior with just a few quality of life adjustments here and there. I will say that I can understand why people who picked this game up during its time of release may have felt cheated once they popped the disc in. The internet was still in its infancy, and so many people were accustomed to purchasing games based solely off of the artwork at this time, much like they were during the Genesis and Super Nintendo days. If you were a teenager around this time, the game's box art wouldn't look too out of place compared to other titles released for that generation of games, and in fact, certain elements of the box art might have even awakened something in you, which may have helped land that sale. However, I'm sure that many who picked the game up solely based off of its artwork or what little they saw in game trailers or magazines were likely a little bit disappointed when they popped the game in and saw what they were actually getting themselves into. Despite sporting vaguely Nintendo 64 era graphics in 2002, the game is still a blast to play today, so much so that it has garnered a bit of a cult status, but what exactly is this game even about? Well, I'll give you a quick synopsis which I pretty much just took straight from the Dark Legacy's manual. The story of Gauntlet takes place in the land of eight magical realms, ruled by a great and powerful wizard named Sumner. Sumner lives in a magical tower with a myriad of portals that allow him to travel easily between the various realms, and he was a good leader who kept the peace. Sumner had a younger brother named Garm who was jealous of his older sibling's power and status. Fueled by his jealousy towards his brother, Garm went off to increase his own magical prowess by finding the 13 legendary rune stones, which would allow him to tap into the power of the underworld. He found 12 of the 13 over several years, but grew impatient and decided to enact his master plan despite being one runestone short. While Sumner was traveling the land to tend to his people, Garm snuck into his brother's tower to chant an incantation that he hoped would bring him ultimate power. His spell ended up opening a portal to the underworld and out came Scorn, the demon prince. Without the 13th runestone, Garm was unable to control Scorn and the demon literally crushed Garm with his bare hands, killing him instantly. Scorn's minions then began pouring through the portal, and Scorn sent his minions throughout the eight realms via Sumner's portals to take over and wreak havoc upon the land. He then had the twelve runestones scattered to the far reaches of each realm so that they could never be used against him again. Sensing that something was wrong, Sumner returned to his tower and saw what happened. Using every last ounce of his strength, Sumner sealed every portal in his tower and fought back the demon. Caught off guard, Scorn fled to an ancient temple and sealed himself away with eight magical shards which were then given to his most powerful generals for safekeeping. Sumner tried but was unable to break the demon's seal due to the energy he used up already to seal the other portals and to fight Scorn. Using the last bit of his strength, he summoned the mightiest heroes from each of the eight realms, with the task at hand being to defeat the demon's generals, gather the shards, find the rune stones, and send Scorn back to where he belongs. It's a pretty engaging little story, and serves as the only bit of lore you need to know to get motivated to get out there. It's easy to rally behind Sumner who really seems to be a benevolent ruler with a bad apple for a brother. You can talk to Sumner at any point during the game for advice, and he seems to be able to speak with you telepathically as well as see your progress as the adventure unfolds. Despite its somewhat gritty story filled with demons, deceit, and so on, Gauntlet Dark Legacy in actuality is almost like a B-movie horror film, the types that are so silly that they're just fun to watch. Dark Legacy is so hammy and so cheesy, and you just can't help but love it. This game didn't take itself too seriously, and the quirkiness of this game I think is a big reason why it has a bit of a cult status amongst fans. Despite the not so great graphics, there is a distinctly 80s appeal to Dark Legacy thanks to its somewhat cartoonishly spooky atmosphere combined with Sumner's over the top narration. Congratulations! You now have enough crystals to enter the Forsaken Province! In a lot of ways, the game reminds me of the He-Man Masters of the Universe cartoons from the 80s. Yeah, Skeletor is this buff demon wizard with a skull for a face and a staff featuring a gnarly ram's head, but you were never actually scared of him when you watched the cartoon. His voice, laughs, and schemes were just so over the top that it was hard to take him too seriously and this kind of thing is very much the same in Gauntlet Dark Legacy. Sure, the main antagonist Scorn is this massive demon that destroys literally anything in his path, but you're not afraid of the prospect of fighting him because you learn through the gameplay that as long as you have enough turkey legs and ham, you know you'll end up on top. 
Gauntlet Dark Legacy has always been a somewhat Halloween adjacent game in my mind thanks to its creepy opening locations like the poison fields and the haunted cemetery, as well as the plethora of zombies and other creepy crawlies that you'll fight along the way. But make no mistake, the Halloween vibes of Dark Legacy have always been more along the lines of a Scooby-Doo type of Halloween as opposed to something like a hereditary or get out type of experience. The level that in my opinion best captures the Halloween vibe that I'm describing is the mausoleum, which is the fourth level within the first major area of the game, the Forsaken Province. This level features easily one of the best and most dynamic songs in the entire game, which is playing right now by the way. It's very Castlevania-esque in its execution, and the level itself is just dripping with atmosphere. You quickly begin to really feel like you're inside of this cold, damp tomb that has been abandoned for years thanks to the blue and green hues and the bleak lighting. There are these seemingly endless pits below the shaky ground that you walk on that are obscured in a thick fog, and there are coffins and cobwebs everywhere. In fact, there are several coffins you'll find littered throughout the map that actually contain someone in there, as you can hear them beating on the wood and screaming for help, but all of the coffins are sealed shut. The mausoleum is filled with the spirits of the undead who are much stronger than the zombies you've faced thus far on your adventure. There are a whole series of switches that will take you to secret areas and there are various goodies hidden behind false walls, but there are also a ton of traps, treasure chests that actually contain bombs inside which will quickly incinerate and destroy any of the other items lying around, and you've also got to watch out for poison barrels and spikes that come out of the floors. And if you're not too careful by the way, the floor might actually crumble out from underneath you. As you climb up through the mausoleum, you discover a statue built in tribute to Scorn, and despite the somewhat primitive graphics of the game, the stained glass windows, which seem to be the only real source of light in here, leave a multicolored reflection on the ground that actually impressed me quite a bit in a visual sense. There is a lot of verticality to this level, and if you manage to find every secret in its winding corridors, you may find yourself with a precious runestone. Something else to keep in mind is that even to get to the mausoleum, you have to fight your way through the poison fields, a ghost town, a haunted cemetery, and then once you make it through the mausoleum, Mausoleum, you'll face off mano a mano against the first boss, the giant zombie Lich King inside of his crypt. There's a perfect gradual crescendo across these first five levels in intensity, and the theming is so strong in my opinion. Come here. In the original version of the game, Gauntlet Legends, you initially started the game off in the much brighter, sunny Mountain Kingdom, which is a rather safe feeling, generic first place to start a medieval adventure game. So I think that when it came time for Dark Legacy, they decided to put you in the Forsaken Province instead to really give you something memorable. If the vibe of the game is the best part of it, a close second must be the gameplay. I've hinted at what Gauntlet's gameplay is like by mentioning games like Golden Axe, the LOTR movie games, and Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance earlier, but none of these games are quite like Gauntlet. Many refer to Gauntlet as a hack and slash, and I would probably use that descriptor first as well, but the game differs from typical entries in this genre in a few subtle ways that give it a very unique feeling. Classic hack and slash games like the aforementioned Golden Axe made by Sega or Capcom's Knights of the Round usually involve mostly close quarters combat making them not too dissimilar from the beat-em-ups that were all the rage in the 90s, like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle games or Final Fight. In Gauntlet, however, while your character does typically wield a sword, a mace, or hammer, most of your combat encounters will feature ranged combat, and so I wouldn't be surprised if I learned one day that Gauntlet may have been an inspiration for twin-stick shooters like Smash TV. You also can level up in this game, find items, treasure, and equipment, but the RPG elements of the Gauntlet games are kept intentionally shallow as they aren't really the main focus. So when it comes to Gauntlet Dark Legacy, it sits in this very unique space where it's not a shooter, but it's also not a hack and slash in the most typical sense, and it's also not an action RPG like the Diablo games, but it does still incorporate a mostly isometric view similar to games like Diablo. You do change classes somewhat in Dark Legacy. You grow substantially stronger over time and gain experience, and you can find equipment that will greatly enhance your powers against Scorn's army. And while all of this does sound a lot like an RPG, Gauntlet isn't deep enough to really be considered one. Some also refer to Gauntlet as a dungeon crawler, and while I think that fits also, I wouldn't say that its gameplay is comparable to many of the other titles in this genre even when you compare it to other dungeon crawlers with a reliance on ranged combat such as Enter the Gungeon. At its heart, it's an arcade game that takes elements from action RPGs, hack and slashes, beat em ups, dungeon crawlers, and shooters, and because it does blend elements from so many disparate genres, it's kind of its own thing. The true beauty of Gauntlet's gameplay is in its intuitive simplicity, similar to how I was describing the simple genius of classic Doom and Mario games. 
This is a game that anyone of any age with any amount of gaming experience can likely hold their own in, and when you have 4 players, it might as well be considered a party game. Combat is very straightforward, you have a light attack and a heavy attack. The light attack is very quick but doesn't do as much damage, while the heavy attack is obviously slower but does roughly 1.5 to 2 times as much damage as the light attack. There are combos that you can do with every character as well. For example, if you press the light attack and then the heavy attack right after in quick succession, the knight will actually turn into a ball of spikes somehow, which is absolutely absurd, but it's also kind of rad, so I won't question it. Another combo usually involves a string of light attacks and then ending them with a couple of heavy attacks. Again with the knight, he will do a series of strikes that eventually leads to him slamming opponents up into the air with his mace, which is infused with some sort of channeled electrical energy. There are also these team combo attacks that you can do together in multiplayer. This special attack is actually unique and changes depending on which characters are interacting with one another, which I thought was a really nice touch. You can do a shoulder bash Wario Land style by pressing one of the trigger buttons, and you can also block incoming attacks by pressing and holding the block button. I will say that blocking is the only thing that's a little difficult to master in this game, but as long as you press and hold the block right before an enemy attacks, you'll be fine. Since you're usually spamming away at your projectiles, if a tanker enemy manages to catch you off guard and gets in your face, it's likely too late to block whatever attack is coming your way. If you do fail to block though, don't worry, the narrator will be sure to give you some sound advice. Learn how to block. The main objective of every level is to clear the floor of enemies and press forward to the next location while trying to find any legendary items like rune stones or the sacred items that will help you defeat the generals. Enemies will spawn into infinity and beyond if you let them. They come out of generators like nests and mine shafts, which have been a staple of Gauntlet gameplay since its inception. It's very satisfying to thrash and smack through a horde of enemies, make your way to their generator and crush it before they can even come out again to attack. And just like it was back in 1985, this gameplay loop will keep you motivated from level to level to level. That was an heroic effort. It's hard to truly capture what makes Gauntlet so great with just footage and explanation. It's one of those games that really shines the most once the controller is in your hands. I personally discovered just how special the game Dark Legacy was when I had my 19th birthday party. I had a bunch of friends from multiple friend groups stay over for the weekend, and some of those friends had never actually even met each other or hung out with one another prior to this date. So I was a little worried about how things would go knowing that, but we all thankfully bonded over Super Smash Bros. Brawl, which was really popular at the time. It was getting to be pretty late that night though, and things were winding down. Some of my friends who couldn't stay the whole weekend went home, and those who were staying with me for the rest of the weekend were starting to get a little tired of Smash Bros by this point. I was scrambling a little bit trying to be a good host, and I started combing through my GameCube and Wii titles looking for a good multiplayer game. Something just told me to try Gauntlet with them. There were four of us, and between all of us we had four controllers, and Dark Legacy is a four player game. When the game started up, I could tell they weren't sure about it, but I told them just to trust me that it was going to be a lot of fun. About four to five hours later, we were absolutely steamrolling through the first few realms in the game. Everyone was having a blast, each of us were playing different roles since the characters are so different from one another, I believe we had a sorcerer, an archer, a dwarf, and I think I was a valkyrie. By this point it must have been 3am and I decided to grab some pizza and before I knew it I passed out on the couch. I woke up probably around 9am that morning to find my three friends in the exact same spot huddled around the TV playing Dark Legacy. They were fighting the Chimera, who was the third guardian in the game, and they were having a blast, laughing their asses off and toying with this guy. I asked them what was so funny, and they explained that they were actually just fighting him over and over again, farming him for experience, so much so that he was becoming a cakewalk. And on a really nice note, one of my friends actually decided to switch to my Valkyrie so that they could level her up for me while I slept. We continue to play Dark Legacy into the day for hours on end. I've never really had an experience with another game quite like this since. I know that by saying all of this, you may feel like I'm pushing for a sequel or remake of Dark Legacy solely because of the nostalgia, but that's not entirely the case. Especially when I look at games that have been popular over the last decade, I think that a new or remade proper 3D gauntlet entry could stand to do well in today's market, or at least carve out a niche following if it were done correctly. I think that a future 3D gauntlet title, whether a remake of Dark Legacy or a wholly original one, could work with this really sinister, dark art style akin to something like Demon's Souls, but I personally think that the game would really shine if it were reimagined in the style of something similar to how the medieval remake was done. Give me some gorgeous spooky set pieces in the vein of Tim Burton crossed with some Castle Grayskull like venues. Give me some colorful and fun character designs with a good amount of detail, and you have something that feels right up my alley, it would probably catch other's eyes and still feels a lot like Gauntlet. 
It was when I saw the HDified hilltop mausoleum level of the medieval remake that I experienced some sort of Jimmy Neutron brain blast like series of thoughts that eventually led to me creating this video. Upon seeing how absolutely gorgeous the stained glass panes and other details in medieval's mausoleum could be, I just immediately started imagining how a similar treatment to Gauntlet Dark Legacy's mausoleum could be breathtaking. Another weird coincidence between these games, by the way, is that the fourth level of both Gauntlet Dark Legacy and Medieval is a mausoleum level, and both mausoleums are entered after passing through a graveyard level, which is again level 3 in both games. Go figure. Before I begin this next piece regarding what I think could benefit a Dark Legacy remake, let me first preface by saying that a simple remastered port of the game released on modern systems with only some aesthetic changes and better audio would be more than enough for most longtime fans of the game, myself included. However, if Dark Legacy were to be remade from the ground up with some minor changes and additions to the gameplay while still maintaining the same general flow and spirit of the original, I think that could be exciting for both fans new and old. I think a remake of Gauntlet Dark Legacy could benefit from a handful of modern features in the gameplay department that fans of somewhat similar games have grown to expect over the years. Any developer charged with the task of remaking a 3D gauntlet has to be careful though and not go too overboard when it comes to feature creep. Dark Legacy's sequel, Gauntlet Seven Sorrows, was supposed to add this massive in-depth story with twists and turns and a more serious tone in general, as well as a complex combo system. It ended up being a shell of the game it was planned to be due to time constraints, and so this didn't pan out. However, I don't think Gauntlet needed to go in that direction in the first place. While saying that I respect John Romero and Josh Sawyer for their work on absolute classics such as Quake and Icewind Dale is a massive understatement, from what I've read in regards to what they were trying to cook up for Gauntlet Seven Sorrows prior to abandoning the project, it sounds like their ambitions would have taken the game a little too far away from the realm of what makes Gauntlet, Gauntlet in my eyes. Nearly a decade later, we received Arrowhead Studios' 2014 reboot of the original Gauntlet. And while I know it was a bit of a mixed bag for fans back then, I have been playing the game side by side with Dark Legacy recently, and in hindsight, I think it offered a lot of interesting and engaging features to the Gauntlet formula, while still making it feel mostly like the 2D Gauntlet that many of us grew up with. The 3D Gauntlet formula, though, is different. Dark Legacy and Legends do have a cult following for a reason, so I think that any future developer trying to revive the series needs to consider what makes these games great specifically, and then consider what they can add to make things fresh while still having that same feel and charm that the originals had. Gauntlet Slayer Edition on PC and PS4 succeeds in offering a modern twist on classic 2D Gauntlet gameplay, but Dark Legacy is a fundamentally different game with understandably different needs, and as it stands, there's nothing like it on the current market. Now, I'm no game developer, but if I were in charge of this project, these are some of the no-brainer features that I think would be great in a Dark Legacy remake. The first and most obvious addition that I can think of to add to a remake of Dark Legacy that would undoubtedly make the game an insta-buy for fans of the original is 4-player online co-op. I have experienced Dark Legacy on Dolphin with Netplay, which is probably the closest thing we have to something like this, and while it was nice, an official, more polished way to experience this would be glorious. Of course, couch co-op is a must as well. Another item that I thought of upon revisiting this game was that when you reach level 30, in the original Dark Legacy, your character would receive a familiar, which is basically a pet that would help you in your journey and actually help fight as well. I think an easy and rewarding feature to implement would be giving players the ability to pick which pet they want and maybe even customize it a little bit in the vein of something like Monster Hunter. Players in general love this stuff, and that's an easy win. Another easy win in my eyes would be making changes to the way that you unlock characters. Dark Legacy actually has a pretty massive roster, and while the game starts you off with 8 characters to choose from, you can unlock secret characters like the Medusa or even a Minotaur if you manage to find and complete secret challenge maps. Though I loved unlocking and trying out new characters in Dark Legacy, I always thought the challenge maps were kind of lame and disjointed from the main gameplay, as they usually involve you just simply running through a random maze trying to collect coins before the time runs out. These challenge maps definitely feel like an afterthought to me compared to the rest of the game. I think that following the lead of a game like 2022's hit indie title Vampire Survivors could benefit a Dark Legacy remake a whole bunch. Instead of just simply running through a coin collecting challenge map to unlock characters, I propose two new changes. The first is that perhaps you could unlock characters by completing certain milestones through normal gameplay, such as a certain number of enemies killed, a certain amount of gold collected, and so on, the way that Vampire Survivors does. 
And I think another idea for unlocking characters that would lend itself especially well to Dark Legacy's focus on exploration is that perhaps in certain levels you can actually find characters imprisoned in hidden areas of the map. You could rescue them with a key after defeating the enemies guarding the cell, and if you manage to escort them out, you can unlock them akin to something like Game Ground on the Sega Genesis. Perhaps you could get a taste of how they play during the escort mission, as they would be controlled by the AI and fight along with you as you both made your way towards the exit. I think having both methods I described of unlocking different characters would give players a reason to keep playing and to keep exploring. And now, onto some of the bigger changes related to the gameplay that I think could work in a Dark Legacy remake. Just a quick reminder though, these are just my ideas and thoughts on some elements that I think might be nice to see. Perhaps there could be a classic mode variant of the main campaign without any of these changes I'm about to mention for any of those diehard Dark Legacy purist fans out there. That way, both parties could be happy. So earlier I mentioned how Dark Legacy could benefit from following Vampire Survivor's lead when it comes to unlocking characters. There are also some other elements from Vampire Survivor's as well that I think could translate beautifully into a modern remake of the game. Dark Legacy was doing auto-attacking 20 years before VS was even on the scene, and both games rely upon similar long-range combat for the most part. I think that in order to up the ante and help bring some more sweet sweet dopamine to our dumb monkey brains, simply being able to clear bigger numbers of enemies in a Dark Legacy remake would be really nice, especially as you level up and get stronger. Perhaps you could have an ability or two on cooldown or utilize items when needed to wipe out waves of opponents at once. Enemies don't have to spawn in at the relentless speed of something like Vampire Survivors, but a happy medium between Dark Legacy and VS's spawn rate would really help make the game feel more epic. Of course, there would have to be a few balance adjustments in the gameplay department to make the characters able to take on all these enemies. The first adjustment I'd make is giving characters special abilities. Though I don't think Gauntlet should ever go nearly as complex as something like Diablo, I think that it would be cool to gain an ability or two as you reach certain levels. Gauntlet borrows RPG elements but never commits to them too hard, and I think increasing the depth here just ever so slightly would help modernize things while still keeping it very Gauntlet in feeling. What I'd suggest doing is that every 10 or so levels, your character has the option to learn a new ability that they can use occasionally on cooldown, similar to how certain abilities and relics work in Gauntlet Slayer Edition. This could be an AoE heal, a defense buff, summoning a ball of fire, shooting down a rain of arrows. It really just depends on what character you're using. But perhaps you could only equip one or two of these at a time, so you have to make decisions on what you want to use in advance. By only having one or two of these special abilities, it gives the game a bit more depth while not turning it into something more complex. Another change that I think could be interesting to Dark Legacy involves its title system. In Dark Legacy, your character does actually graduate and change into new classes upon reaching certain levels. For example, a knight will gain titles like Guard, Protector, and so on as he levels up. With these new titles, your character, armor, and weapon appearance will change slightly, and they generally grow to look stronger as you play further and further into the game. While it does look cool to see your character physically look stronger as they reach these milestones, and I really do love this when games do this, as far as I'm aware, it's just a purely aesthetic change to your character outside of some of the ranks that give you a pet. I think including this level ranking system again could be really cool, but perhaps this time around you actually can choose if you want to take on that title or not. And different classes could actually have different stat buffs and abilities that come along with them. Maybe a guard learns different abilities over time or has slightly different stat increases than a regular knight would, and so if you choose to stay as a knight, you might not gain those additional perks, but perhaps you could level up faster. So if you don't like the abilities that a guard learns or the playstyle associated with that title, but you do like the sound of the next class, which is a protector, you could choose to instead stay as a knight, level up faster while dealing with some of the drawbacks like lesser defensive power or something along those lines, and then choose to spec into a protector faster faster than you would have had you chosen to change into a guard first. It's very light RPG stuff here that I'm describing because we're talking about only minor changes and only a few abilities, but it would give players some agency and more meaning to the character titles while still not being too complex. I don't think a Gauntlet Dark Legacy remake should worry too much about equipment and armor and all of those things, but another element I'd add that I think would benefit the exploration department of this game would be one-time character-specific armor pieces and weapons. 
These can be littered around certain areas of the map off the beaten path, and this would give you more incentive to scour the various maps and search far and wide. But because every character would only have one set of items to find, we still wouldn't be turning the game into a full-fledged RPG. And for those who want an additional challenge, they could choose to ignore any of the armor pieces they find and also refuse to rank up into other classes in order to keep the difficulty high. Lastly, when it comes to the combat, every character in Dark Legacy is a ranged character fundamentally, and this is true even when you're talking about characters typically seen as hand-to-hand -hand combatants like a warrior or a dwarf. Though this has always seemed a little odd to me, logically speaking, it's been a staple of Gauntlet gameplay since the beginning, and so I think many just accept it for what it is. Gauntlet Slayer Edition did tackle this issue head-on though by making certain characters like the Valkyrie and Warrior melee characters exclusively. The benefit of this was that every character felt different in Gauntlet Slayer Edition, as the elf fought nothing like the warrior who also fought nothing like the wizard. It's important to commend this because a common complaint with Dark Legacy, even upon its initial release, is that the characters started to feel very similar to one another, especially once they are all leveled up to the point where the stat differences don't really matter that much. If our hypothetical developer wanted to keep the spirit and general gameplay of the original Dark Legacy the same in a remake by ensuring that every character is still a long-range character, while still trying to make each character feel unique simultaneously, I think a healthy compromise would be that melee characters could receive certain benefits by engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Even in the original Dark Legacy, if your character is within arm's length of an enemy, they will swing their weapon of choice rather than throwing it. So this was clearly something that Midway was already thinking about when designing the original game. Perhaps the warrior could receive damage boosts by engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and these damage boosts would dissipate as you start to put more distance between yourself and your foes until eventually resetting to zero. Conversely, perhaps a character like the archer could gain slight attack speed or movement speed boost by not getting hit, which would entail you having a good keep away game in line with the character's implied playstyle. The characters could also level up at different rates to help make them feel more unique at higher levels. In the original, every character leveled up a static 5 points in every stat upon each level up, but I think that making their stat growth less static and more in line with their character archetype, for example an archer being fast or a wizard having high magic would make more sense. Maybe a dwarf literally gains 0 points in speed at certain level ups, but you can generally always expect him to grow in attack power. Meanwhile, the much weaker jester might not get as many gains when it comes to his attack power, but you can generally rest knowing that his attack speed and movement speed will only get better and better. So those are some of my ideas for a Gauntlet Dark Legacy remake that I think might make the game better. Though I can daydream all day long, the unfortunate thing is that Warner Bros, who now owns all of Midway's IPs after the company went bankrupt in 2009, they don't seem to have any desire to push out anything that isn't triple-A Mortal Kombat. And though I am a Mortal Kombat fan, I don't like the single-minded focus that Warner Bros has on that series. Gauntlet is a franchise that could be really unique compared to its peers because of its core gameplay loop while also benefiting a lot by borrowing a couple of the best features from certain modern games occupying a similar double-A type of space. And I I think there's an appeal for this game too because gamers nowadays have access to so many different games for a cheap price, so it's not a stretch to imagine that a curious gamer will play a larger variety of games throughout their lives than those who played in the 80s and 90s, especially considering that the hobby wasn't nearly as socially acceptable. It stands to reason that one singular person may enjoy games like Diablo, the various Soul games, Baldur's Gate, Dragon's Crown, Enter the Gungeon, and Vampire Survivors all at once. I know this because I am that guy. And yet, if you tried to place all of these games on the spectrum between action RPG, wave shooters, hack and slashes, and dungeon crawlers, a game like Gauntlet Dark Legacy would still be pretty unique even though I consider those aforementioned games likely the closest to Gauntlet in style and gameplay. The truth is, nothing has ever been able to quite scratch that 3D Gauntlet itch again for me ever since I first tried out Dark Legacy in 2007 or so, and that's a real shame. Maybe one day we'll see the familiar phoenix rise from the ashes again, but until then, I'll continue to mow down mobs of enemies in the eight realms when the urge strikes. Gauntlet is a game I'll never forget, even if sometimes it feels like its owners have. If you haven't already yet, I hope you give it a shot one day, preferably with some buddies. If you're still here, thanks so much for watching, and as always, stay humble.